apologies. Please join. Thanks, Provost Anne. Good morning, members. Provost Jim Todd. Yeah. Councillor Stephen Canning. Present, thanks. Councillor Ellen Field. I'm here, Julie. Thanks. Councillor John McFadgen. Councillor John McGee. Yeah. Councillor Elaine Cowan. Here. I have an apology from Councillor Maureen Mackay. Councillor David Richardson. Present, Julie. Thank you. Councillor James Adams. Present. Councillor Lillian Jones. Present, Julie. Councillor Ian Linton. Yeah. Councillor Douglas Sheet. Councillor Graham Barton. Yep, here. I have an apology from Councillor Graham Boyd. Councillor Barry Douglas. Here. Councillor Neil Ingram. Yeah, thanks, Julie. Councillor Peter Mabin. Present, Julie. Thank you. Councillor Claire Maitland. Here. Councillor Beverly Clark. Here. Councillor Sally Cogley. Here. I have an apology from Councillor Kevin McGregor. Councillor Linda Holland. Here, Julie. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Provost Claire Leach. Here, Cheers, Julie. Councillor William Lennox. Morning, here. Councillor Alison Simmons. Here. Councillor Billy Crawford. Here. Councillor Jim Kyle. Present. Councillor Jim McMahon. Yeah, Julie, thanks. Councillor Neil Watts. Uh, I'm here, Julie. Thank you. Councillor Drew Felson. Here. Councillor Jennifer Hogg. Here. And Councillor Elaine Stewart. Here, thanks, Julie. Thanks, members. Thanks very much, Julie. <clears throat> members, uh, just some remarks before we start. It's the uh, 22nd of February was the Ayrshire Businesswomen's AGM at the Park Hotel. Uh, it was great to, to meet all some really inspiring women, uh, women who have done so much in Ayrshire. And it was a real pleasure to present Patricia Elliott with the spirit of the Ayrshire Businesswomen's Award. Uh, Patricia is a great example of success through adversity. So please, please read about Patricia. Patricia's story, it's amazing. Uh, a burnt supper at the Park School. As I've said before, the Park School burnt supper uh, is the best burnt supper I go to every year. It's getting bigger and bigger, and it was great to hear the S2 pupils this year delivering the motto memory. They do it so well because it's the pupils that arrange everything, um, and they do all the organising and they do all the entertainment, and it's primary ones all the way through, so good for them. Uh, the World Book Day, I, I noticed a lot of councillors went along to different schools. Uh, I went to Annan Hill, read to the P2 class, uh, really good class, asked loads of questions. And then uh, then over to Shortley's Primary, and uh, I read out Super Worm to the children. This was a, a, a jammy story. So it was an evening to them. It was by the back at four o'clock, but they all came in their jammies and they'd hot chocolate, so they loved it. And then we a lovely invite on the 9th of March to Ardrossan, St. Peter in the Change Church, for the ordination of Bishop Frank Dugan. Um, I knew a lot of faces from Kilmarnock area, and uh, Frank's from Motherwell, and he's the new bishop of the Ayrshire and Galloway Diocese. So it'll be great to work with him in the future. He's a Motherwell supporter. Uh, Scottish Schools National Badminton Championships at the Grange, that was on the 10th of March, and it was great to see uh, secondary uh, children playing in a brilliant facility at the Grange, and it was great to see young Scottish players um, uh, really excelling at their sport. So I wish them all the best. And then it was the William McIlvany campus to present the awards at the Pipe Band Championships. This is the Scottish Schools Pipe and uh, Drumming uh, Championships. And a real treat for everybody that was there was Fred Morrison. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows who Fred is. He's one of the best uh, bagpipe players in the world. I've only seen him in a telly at Celtic Connections, so it was great to see him live. And he played three pieces. And my goodness, what an inspiration for the young folks. So congratulations to all the worthy winners. Uh, the Lost Villages exhibition at the Baird Institute on Friday the 15th. Absolutely brilliant exhibition and some great stories from real people about how life was and all of these villages that we've lost. Uh, a, a brilliant exhibition. Please, everyone, go along. Take your families along to that. A great another one with music, Spring Spectacular Senior Concert on the 18th of March at the Grange. And it was great to see all of our uh, senior uh, pupils playing a whole range of instruments. And the one that blew me away was the xylophone with the percussion side. I thought it was at a concert anywhere, and that's how good these children were, so good for them. 
And then it was great to go up to Stuart on the 23rd of March, Saturday, for the opening of the community hub. And it's a cracking wee building right there. It's not taking anything away from the site. It enhances the site. And it's going to be a place for people to meet on a regular basis and for groups to meet and uh, have a coffee and chat. So well done to them. And uh, before we move on, I got a lovely card from Linda. Uh, thanking everyone here at East Ayrshire and all the members for uh, the kind words uh, the sad time that your family's went through. So thanks for the lovely card. Uh, I'm going to open up now, folks. We're going to ask for declarations of interest. Barry, yep. Thanks, Provis. Just I'll declare as I usually do um, for item number seven, which is for the LDP. Uh, whilst I work for a new renewables developer who don't have any active projects in East Ayrshire, that's not to say that won't be during the course of this LDP. So I'll step out for that part of the meeting. Provis, thanks. No, no, that's very kind. Thanks for letting us know. Uh, guys, I'm going to go into item two, which is the previous minutes of the council, and I move uh, both minutes as a correct record. Second, Provost. Thank you very much, Deputy Provost. Are there any questions, folks? Leader. Just on uh, page 12 in the uh, long-term plan for the t uh, our town's Kilmarnock, it was just maybe to mention, just for members' information, mm. that we, we held our first meeting, uh, uh, Councillor Douglas and I attended that yesterday. Uh, and hopefully we'll be reporting back to the, the council on it. But just to let know that the new chair is uh, Fiona McKenzie from Centre Stage, and uh, I'm just wishing her the best of luck in that position. Thanks for that. Looking forward to working with Fiona. Folks, we OK? Thank you. I'm going to item three, which is the Cabinet Committee Minutes. And as usual, I'll ask the leader to uh, move uh, on block. Move on, Bob. Provost, a correct record. Second up, Provost. Thank you, Deputy Leader. Folks, any questions? Nothing online either. No, thanks, Julie. Thanks, folks. Item four is the activities of the Governance and Scrutiny Committee. This is the annual report for 2023, pages 39 to 51. And we'll bring in Councillor Jones. Lillian. Good morning, Provost, members, and thank you for the opportunity to present my report on the activities of the Governance and Scrutiny Committee for 2023 to you today. Now, I don't intend reading through this report, as I know members will, already, will have done so already. However, if I may, I would like to just touch on some highlights from within the report. Back in March of 23, and as detailed at paragraphs 5 through 7 of the report, the committee considered the called-in decision of Cabinet of January 2023 relating to the lease of the former Old People's Cabin within Howard Park, Kilmarnock. Now, having considered the call-in and providing recommendations back to Cabinet for their consideration, Cabinet agreed to two of the recommendations as detailed at paragraph 6 of the report. I am advised that the Kilmarnock Station Railway Heritage Trust continue to progress with the refurbishment of the Old People's Cabin and as agreed communication has continued to be circulated regarding the project with the community being updated on progress including a stakeholder meeting held to better understand the challenges moving forward. And further to that, notices for both the consideration and the decision of the Sheriff Court application were displayed as per legal requirements in local press. Now, the next update stage is proposed to be details on any funding awards which will be posted on the building itself. Now, the organisation have revised the cost for the project, which total around £750,000, and will be applying to various funding streams to move this project forward. And I wish Kilmarnock Station Railway Heritage Trust every success to deliver the specialised counselling services for low to moderate mental health issues for people who would otherwise be on a waiting list indefinitely. Paragraphs 9 through 12 details following a request by Cabinet, the outcome of the committee's consideration of the funding allocated to and the, and the numbers attending the warm welcome spaces within East Ayrshire. Now, whilst the cost of living crisis continues to have a devastating impact on our communities, the importance of the warm welcome spaces continues to play a role in mitigating against the cost of living crisis. However, unfortunately, there remains no measurable outcome of the success of the warm welcome spaces across East Ayrshire. And paragraph 13 is really just a reminder that topic review suggestions can be submitted from a range of sources, including elected members, officers, partners and members of the public. 
Paragraphs 14 through 23 highlights the internal audit standards. Now, following the annual review by Audit Scotland for 22-23, the Audit Scotland annual report was presented to Governance and Scrutiny on the 12th of October 2023, which found the Council's internal audit to be operating effectively and in line with the public sector internal audit standards requirements. And also, as part of the Quality Assurance and Improvement Programme, the Council undertakes an independent external quality assessment every five years, and in April 23, the second EQA reinforced the point that internal audit was well positioned within the organisation and a highly valued team that makes an active contribution to the overall council governance arrangements. Further, paragraph 28 reflects the committee's consideration of required matters relating to external audit. Members noted through the 22-23 annual audit report, which was presented in October 23, that the audit took cognizance in particular of the conclusions that the Council continued to have strong effective financial management and robust governance and decision-making arrangements. Now, this was particularly reassuring, as we all know the future of the Easter Council and all other councils will be hugely challenging financially, meaning we will be faced with very difficult decisions. Now, throughout 2023, the committee received numerous education reports, including HMIE inspections for Muirkirk Primary School and Early Childhood Centre, as well as Gargaston and St Andrews Primary Schools and Early Childhood Centres. Now, we have continued to recognise the importance of the effective delivery of educational services to our young people across East Ayrshire. In August 23, the committee received a report on initial leave or destinations of young people who had attended ASN schools in school session 21-22. Now, although there has been some employability support for individual young people undertaking training, it is my hope that support will increase for all our young people with ASN, as well as opportunities for employment for those young people who have the ability and the ambition to put their skills and learning into action. In November 2023, committee received a presentation from the corporate fraud team detailing some of the work undertaken during the year. The committee recognised the importance of the partnership working, particularly with housing, around identifying and reclaiming tenancy abandonments to then relet the property as quickly as possible, which is so important now more than ever, as currently we have over 4,700 people on our housing waiting list who desperately need a home. Throughout the year, committee noted a number of awarding of contract reports, which has highlighted the success of the provision of defibrillators for communities as part of the Community Benefit Scheme. The most recent being West Netherton Bowling Club yesterday, where I was joined by my award colleagues, Councillors Linton and Adams, as well as Councillor McMahon within his spokesperson role. This has indeed been a fantastic initiative brought forward by Health and Safety and, Procure and the Procurement Department. So my thanks to those two departments, both David and Leslie. As the provision of the defibrillators naturally comes to an end, I am pleased the Community Benefit Scheme will shift focus towards cost of living initiatives, including the provision of cooking utensils and air fryers, etc., for our most vulnerable families across East Ayrshire. And finally, Provost, I would like to take this opportunity to thank my fellow members for their continued cont contributions throughout the year, as well as the efforts and the invaluable input from officers and all others who have been involved in supporting the committee, including our external auditors, Audit Scotland. Thank you very much. Provost. Thank you very much, Lillian. Uh, members, are there any questions? Leader. Well, I was just to congratulate some of the good work that's been uh, Lillian spoke of there in terms of, particularly in terms of best value th uh, thematic review and some of the work in education inspections and uh, what we're doing there. And uh, good to see there's been progress in that asset transfer in terms of the Howard Park. I think, uh, you know, I think it's been. Uh, we need to inform the public just how progress is going on there, and that's good to have that information that progress has been made. And good to see the uh, community benefit as well, in terms of the number of, of some amount of uh, defibrillators that we've put out there in our communities. And uh, unfortunately, I couldn't make the one at West Netherlands myself last night, but I was at the meeting with Barry in, uh, at the town centre, but we can't, can't be everywhere. But I uh, hope that, that, uh, that goes down well to the, the folk at uh, West Netherlands Bowling Club being the latest, but that's been really something that others, I know other authorities are quite jealous of, uh, that we are able to deliver that. But uh, just can, uh, thank Lillian and the uh, Governance Security to come out for all the hard work. Thank you. Councillor Cogley. Thank you, Provost. And really just to thank Lillian for her role in chairing this, this committee, which she does brilliantly. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, are we OK? Nothing online. Yeah. Councillor Maitland, clear. 
Good morning. I'd also like to thank Lillian for a report, but just a reminder that the Cost of Living Welcome Spaces won the MGA award. So although um, she might not consider there were any measurable outcomes, um, I think winning the award proves that there was. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Folks, anything else? OK, that's great. Thanks very much. Thanks, Lillian. Uh, we're going to item five now, folks. This is the digital strategy update, pages 52 to 74, and Paul's going to introduce this paper. Uh, thank you, Provost, and good morning, members. Uh, first of all, thank you again for the opportunity to come and uh, update you on the progress of our digital strategy. There are nine recommendations detailed in, within paragraph two of the report that members are asked uh, to note and approve. Members are reminded that in October 2022, Council approved the, the Council Strategic Framework 2022 to 2027 with a suite of reports, including the digital strategy. From there, officers were remitted to establish a digital uh, management board and develop a digital action plan. Work has continued to develop the suite of reports contained within the framework, and today's update follows on from our recent presentations to you, where we highlighted the ongoing work in delivering a corporate telephony approach ensuring that telephone contact within the Council is effective and consistent. And we also demonstrated our continued migration to the Microsoft 365 cloud platform. Our digital strategy sets out our vision to 2027 and beyond. Our vision, objectives and roadmap to transformation and how we will use the power of technology to improve service delivery to our communities. In paragraph 12, we acknowledge that technology and innovation will bring opportunities around the streamlining and, and automation of processes, access to better information and improved healthcare and education services. But at the same time, we recognise it can also present complex challenges, particularly around increased cyber threats, as well as potentially widening the digital divide. It's important, therefore, as we go forward, that we balance the pursuit of innovation with the mitigation of risk, harnessing the full potential of technology for the benefits of everyone who wants to be connected digitally, whilst recognising that some within our communities who don't want to be still require access to a wide range of our services. As a reminder, members, the five themes of our strategy are detailed in paragraph 14, digital uh, customers, council, services, communities and culture. And the, increased in, the, the continued increase in customer accounts and online transactions are a clear indication of the appetite for digital change. That said, telephone calls to the Council remain sufficiently high to confirm human interaction also remains important, with a continued need to support assisted digital solutions and non-digital channels which confirm our commitment to inclusion with no one left behind. Paragraph 17 to 24 provide members with an update on the establishment of the Digital Management Board, specifically that the board has now been commissioned. The Council Management Team will act as project sponsor and the Chief Financial Officer and Head of Finance and ICT as Chair. The terms of reference are set out in Appendix 1. Members are asked to note that the board will be comprised of officers from across finance and ICT, as well as service-based colleagues. The board will deliver against the digital action plan attached to the appendix two by working across services to identify projects that will bring about digital change through innovation. The board will approve the management programme of digital projects as they develop and the project management office will provide a monitoring and coordination role for the digital action plan and associated work streams. Work continues at pace to deliver the digital strategy and members recently had an opportunity to hear more about our corporate approach to telephony. Paragraphs 25 to 53 provide further detail on the planned changes to our telephony platform. Whilst planning and implementation started pre-pandemic, we cannot understate the role the pandemic played in rapid and accelerated change. This work continues to build on the proactive and responsive changes that finance and ICT colleagues made um, at the start of the pandemic, and now almost four years on, we now deliver customer services through our uh, virtual contact centre, our digital first approach. Paragraphs 30 to 36 provide members with more detail on the data intelligence we can now gather and how we can use that data to improve call handling to ensure a high quality service and positive customer experience. With over 380,000 calls received annually, it's clear that telephone contact remains the preferred route of contacting the Council 
for many service users across our communities. The service dashboards that we recently demonstrated to members will provide real-time monitoring of calls and support more, pro more proactive resource call handling. And whilst we can use historical data intelligence to better plan for peak telephony events, we also recognise that more intel intelligent use of customer data presents opportunities in the longer term too. Paragraphs 37 to 40 provide members with further information on the introduction of our One Number Service, or ONS, to support the flexible working arrangements contained in the workforce strategy. This will enable incoming calls received via our contact centre to be efficiently handed over more, to more appropriate officers um, based within services. The ONS development is currently being finalised with live configuration and, de and deployment to appropriate services um, during the coming weeks. A corporate training and development framework will support the implementation of the corporate telephone approach, as highlighted in paragraphs 41 to 43. And our customer charter, which is currently being updated and refreshed, is included as Appendix 3. Going forward, we will take time to develop the, the Council's customer contact centre, in particular the use of the telephone number 55400 as our corporate telephone number. And consideration will also be given to the longer term development of a multi skilled customer contact approach. We can also confirm the introduction of video call appointments where required. And this information is contained within paragraphs 45 to 53 for your information. Members were also recently updated in the Council transition to Microsoft 365, and paragraphs 54 to 64 provide further detail on this piece of work. This remains a complex and challenging project. We quickly learned from working with peers and with our Microsoft partner that M365 is not an out-of-the-box plug-and-play solution. We are therefore grateful to have been afforded time to take a very diligent approach to our transition. This helped us work through the challenges as we encountered them and to deliver the project with minimum disruption to our services. Paragraph 58 confirms the arrangements we have put in place to use multi-factor authentication, highly recommended by both Microsoft and the National Cyber Security Centre. And we will continue to work with our partners to develop secure access to file sharing both internally and externally through OneDrive and SharePoint. Future federation with neighbouring authorities and the Health Trust is also on our roadmap and again it will be delivered securely and having taken due regard of the potential cyber threat to our M365 environment. Paragraph 65 to 72 details some of the work delivered by the Finance and ICT Business Innovation Team. This team already supports digital services and solutions across council services and led the work in our customer service platform where some 20,000 submissions are now processed monthly. The team was created as part of the Finance and, IT, uh, Finance and ICT service redesign to provide specialist technical support to services to allow them to update system workflows and processes and embed new digital practices that would deliver digital savings where the financial gain can be taken and used against future budget gap targets. Information on the future work of the team is provided in paragraph 72, and members are asked to note that pivotal, the pivotal role the team will take in driving forward service-based digital efficiencies. Paragraph 73 to 75 advise members that finance and IT are currently investigating, investigating the use of automation, robotics and artificial intelligence, and looking at how the use of these technologies can enhance our customer experience, as well as improving efficiency through process streamlining and cost reduction. As well as our own research, we will learn from other adopters and will follow best practice and guidance at all times to ensure the integrity of our systems and data are not compromised. Paragraph 76 asks members to note the work of the Digital Access Network as a collaborative approach for bridging the digital divide through signposting our communities towards affordable broadband access to devices and internet safety training. Paragraph 77 highlights the work undertaken by colleagues in the Health and Social Care Partnership to invest in digital telecare, which can play a significant role in enabling individuals um, with chronic illnesses or disabilities to stay in their homes longer. The technology is now being showcased in the interactive smart hub based in Galston, allowing health professionals and service users and their families to make more informed choices on the most appropriate telecare aids to support greater independence and quality of life at home. Paragraph 78 to 80 advise members of the work we continue to undertake to protect our wider ICT infrastructure against the cyber threat. 
And as highlighted previously, our transition to Microsoft 365 has made us more reliant on the Microsoft suite of security products, but still within an industry recommended layered context. We will continue to follow best practice from the National Cybersecurity Centre. And in February 2024, it was also confirmed that our council remained fully compliant with the requirements of the UK Government Public Services Network. As we continue to invest in additional security products, most notably the External Security Operations Centre outlined in paragraph 79, we must continue to remain vigilant to cyber complacency and to the threat and management of risks. We will therefore continue to robustly manage our ICT infrastructure by implementing strong security policies, undertaking staff awareness training and maintaining regular patch management schedules. Paragraphs 81 to 83 update members on their accessibility progress that can, continues at pace as the project team work to fulfil the tasks set out in the Accessibility Action Plan. Early priorities included an assessment of our current position in terms of compliance and employee training. In January, we procured a software package which scans the corporate website and identifies errors in areas where our content may not be fully compliant in terms of meeting the accessibility guidelines. The accessibility project team are working through these issues and linking with relevant services to make the necessary changes. We also recently purchased a program of accessibility training courses and around 150 employees from across the council have now completed some basic introductory training on how to create accessible content, videos, social media and accessible graphic design. These training materials will shortly be made available to all employees through the Council's online training platform, LearnPro. Our current focus is on the corporate website, but the project team will be applying the same rigorous assessment to all other EAC websites as the project evolves, and regular updates will be provided to the Council management team. Members, we are committed to community engagement as we deliver a digital strategy. In paragraphs 84 and 86, set out our commitment to that engagement and our focus on delivering the shared priorities of the community plan. Paragraphs 87 to 90 advise members on their human resource implications. We will continue to, to follow the Council's FACE principles and recognising the important contribution employees will make to delivering Council services more digitally. We have aligned the digital strategy to the workforce strategy and we have also consulted and engaged with our trade union colleagues. Paragraphs 91 to 94 reaffirm our commitment to delivering services that are, that are fair for all. We remain mindful of the need to undertake equality impact assessments where required. And where workforce planning is, is impacted, we will be equally mindful of the impact on the protected characteristics of our workforce. Paragraphs 95 and 96 confirm that whilst there are no direct financial applications, the digital, the digital strategy is also linked to the medium term financial strategy one of the themes being service-based digital efficiencies. And through the Digital Management Board, we will work to deliver this. Paragraphs 97 to 99 focus on risk, and members are asked to note that without the effective implementation of a digital strategy, there is a risk the Council will not, uh, will, sorry, will fail to respond to digital change. I hope this report has provided you with some further detail around the steps we are taking to deliver the digital strategy. And as a reminder, members, the recommendations are set out in paragraph two for your consideration. Chair, I'm happy to stop there and through you take any further questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. I appreciate it. I'm going to open it up now. Councillor Linton. Thanks, Provost. And can I thank uh, Paul and Joe and all the staff involved in the tremendous amount of work that's been on to bring today's paper. I mean, this is been going on behind the scenes and I really want to take this opportunity to express my thanks for all those involved. I think Paul was right to point up the kind of general trend towards the you know, us becoming more dependent on Microsoft 365. We're not alone in that. I mean, I think that's a trend across all businesses and, and uh, public uh, organisations. And I think it's becoming more difficult not to follow that trend. I think, I think, <laughs> covered a bit of business by Microsoft, they're, they're, they're kind of pushing us down a road here. But I mean, as long as everything's working fine, that's 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 great. So I'm happy to support this paper. Thank you. Councillor Holland. Thanks, Provost. Um, thanks, Paul, for Joe. And as, as Councillor Linton says, all the hard work that's went into the report. Um, I've got a couple of wee points, and it's really just 
comments rather than, than anything else. In paragraph 16, and I know I've harped on about this at, at other meetings, so I'm, I'm not apologising. It says about the people who won't or can't support the the digital, basically digital anything. So I get, I get you're saying there, you're reaffirming the commitment that no one is left behind, but is that going to be a long-term guarantee? And if I may, if I refer to paragraph 26, you're talking about the the one number, is, is that one number going to get you to a person or do you have to go through the press one, press five, press seven and everything? So I suppose the two points I'm making are kind of one in the same. I'm, I'm thinking of people who are going to struggle with that kind of thing moving forward, which we do have a lot of. Thank you. Um, yep, yeah, through you, Chair. Um, the commitment is long term to make sure that everybody who wants to deal with the council in a non-digital fashion will, will remain the trend that has to be indicated, whether that's you know, through telephone calls, which, as I say, because of the numbers that we're, we're taking, it's absolutely clear that, that telephony is still a, a major player in terms of, of communicating with the council. So, yes, the answer is yes, that commitment is there. In terms of ONS, um, the, the difference between ONS and Customer Contact Centre, if I can maybe just give you some detail on that. So the Customer Contact Centre being the first point of contact will be menu driven. So it will be a case of press option one, two, three or four. And that would then direct you through a call handler. ONS comes in at the back end of that and where a contact centre operator can't answer um, a question, the ONS allows that call to be transferred out to an appropriate officer. So ONS will be provided to all telephone extensions on the council network. The telephone user, the, the, the member of staff, will, will set their phone where they want to answer their call, whether it's on a mobile, whether it's um, at their, their house phone. An office they happen to be in today could be a different office tomorrow. So ONS gives that flexibility to say, where do I want to answer my call on a daily basis? And if they're off on holiday, they can divert to things like mobile to um, voicemail, or they can divert to um, admin support. So there are two distinct environments. You've got the contact centre will remain menu driven, but ONS is that additional flexibility that says to staff, you might move around, but you can take your calls with you, either on a mobile, at your desk phone, or at your home, wherever you happen to be based on, on a particular day. Does that sort of clarify the, the two differences? Thank you, Chair. No, no, really, really good point. Councillor McFadge. Oh, sorry, Eddie, yep. Yeah. Eddie. I suppose just as an, an additional assurance uh, to members, one of the other things that's coming alongside this, and the staff know I love this, is dashboards. So all heads of service, we've got a dashboard, and I've got a dashboard for everybody that actually shows the number of calls coming in, how long it's taking to answer, and importantly to your stuff, Councillor Holland, what's the fall-off? You know, what people don't actually get through so we can actually measure the effectiveness of, of this service, you know, do it at a service level, do it at a corporate level, so we can see how long it's taken to actually answer phones service by service and if there are any services that there are significant fall off, which might indicate access issues if there are significant, you know, look fall off, that we can monitor that and look at it. So alongside the work that's going on is that very much performance management, you know, ability for us to actually see that right across the council. Thank you. Yes, I, Paul and Joe, I'd like to thank you for the work you're putting to do in this and the whole rest of the team and also for coming out and seeing us as a group. You know, it's good to have that sort of input before we find, find all what goes on today. Uh, just one thing I was wondering, with the move forward in technology, I mean, that that's fabulous. But effectively, we'll be able to let a lot of customers in the door a lot quicker, a lot faster. But I'm just looking for a reassurance that we will then monitor the workload and the human workforce that's going to, you know, be handling all this work that's coming in at a greater speed and, you know, greater access to people may phone up or ask about things they might not normally have bothered with because it was difficult before. But as we ease the access in, we will need to then, you know, monitor just the people at the end, just that they're not going to get pushed too much and whatnot. So, you know, it's just a... a No, that's uh, another fair point, absolutely. Councillor Richardson. Just yeah, from what I'm hearing from officers and the response to Councillor Holland and good points there uh, made by Councillor McFadden, it sounds very much like um, possibly we're moving towards a telephone system, the type of which my other employer currently has. 
And I think, um, if I'm right, it will give the management within the council access to data at their fingertips. So I see Joe nodding his head. So basically, you'll have a system where um, it'll give management the ability to show the number of incoming calls, how quickly they were handled, basically what the outcome of those calls were. In fact, you can probably drill into every call to find out what the outcome of that call was, if, if I'm right. So I, I'm getting a feeling that, um, yeah, I sort of know already the type of telephone system that moving to, uh, we're about to move to, I think. And if I can then through you, Chair, uh, Provost Rather. Um, you're absolutely right. So there's a number of different strands to this. The obvious one is it's a telephone system that when you phone it, it will be answered. And hopefully it'll have one time resolution when you do call us, and that's that's fine. Um, Paul explained ONS, but the whole number of things alongside that. Ultimately, this is about um, a telephone system that for the first time is now linked to our customer service platform. So when you phone in to 55 if you have a customer account, then we'll know who's phoning before we answer it. We can then provide analysis of what the call was about, just as you said, Councillor Richardson. And over time, that data becomes intelligence. And at that point, we then drive forward change. We look at early intervention and prevention. We find out who the frequent flyers are, we find out what the bigger issues is, and we can take steps along those lines. So that's the ultimate aim of this as well, which is um, a journey we're on that's quite interesting, um, but that's ultimately where we are. And those dashboards that Eddie described are part of that too. Well, so we'll Councillor Mabin. Thank you, Provost. Um, go back to page 65, paragraph 90. The consultation with trade unions took place. Can I ask how that went? What's, what's the trade union saying? What's the concerns of their staff? And uh, will, will there be further consultation? Will elected members be involved in any of these consultations? So through you, Provost. So it's, it's, a, it's a massive piece of work. Um, we've, we've consulted with a whole range of individual and organisations. Um, I suppose to give the, the, the importance of this piece of work and to show just how different it's been treated, the first group we met with and we consulted with was the employer, was the, the, the Disability Forum. Um, and we've met them three times to talk them through what this means for folk who need support. When it comes to trade unions, then it's about the Microsoft 365 and it's about that ONS and that call that's coming in. The trade unions have been really supportive of the way forward and the approach. They recognise that in order to safeguard the council going forward, um, that digital isn't just about a QWERTY keyboard. And through this report, Paul has highlighted a number of occasions that it's linked to the medium term financial strategy, linked to the workforce strategy. Another key part in this is service-based digital efficiencies. It's in everywhere. It's in the medium-term financial strategy and in here. Because we know that going forward and when we present you with the budget for next year or the year after, and that significant gargantuan gap that's going to be there, you'll expect us to have taken steps through digital, through automation, through robotics, through a whole number of things to have reduced that gap. And so that service-based digital efficiencies, that team that Mary Claire leads that will be deployed across council services to support that workflow change um, is part of that too. So consultation has taken place. It's been warmly received and we're grateful for the advice and, and um, guidance we've been given. But it's a, it's a process that will continue throughout this, this report and for the many months and years to come as we take this forward. Thanks. Councillor Barton. Thanks, Provost. Well, technology clearly moves at pace, and I think we need to move with it. Reassuring to, to hear that no one's going to be left behind. So I think it's important we recognise the work that the Equalities Forum have put into that and the consultation we've had with them. So I'd just like to thank the work they've put in. Good. Folks, we OK? Hey, can I just say, um, I don't know if anybody has had the joy of trying to renew your car or motorcycle or house insurance lately. If you haven't, you'll be very surprised at the the jump, sometimes 
and the absolute hassle of going online and trying to get a new insurance. So I'm really reassured that a, an individual, as Linda said, an individual can get to a human being who will understand exactly what they're talking about. Four hours one day, my goodness. And, it, and all I could get was a double. Absolutely shocking. I'll leave everybody's views on why that has jumped so much. Uh, folks, are we okay? There's uh, The recommendations are on uh, page 52. We're okay. Great. Thank you very much, folks. Uh, I'm going to go into item six, which is uh, changes from the SNP group. They're all there. The names are on there. Are we okay with that? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. And then on to the final item, which is the local development plan two. This is the intention to adopt an, uh, and a direction by the Scottish Ministers, pages 76 to 83, and we'll bring in Karen. Over to you, Karen. Thanks, Provost. So the purpose of this report is to present to Council the outcome of the Local Development Plan 2 examination being submitted to Scottish Ministers for final approval and to seek authority to accept the direction laid down by Scottish Ministers. On the 24th of February 2024, Council agreed to proceed with adoption processes for LDP2, and on the 5th of March, we submitted the plan to Scottish Ministers. And as per Section 19 of the Town and Country Planning Act, the Council can adopt the plan 28 days after submission of the plan to Ministers. However, Ministers can, within that 28-day period, issue a direction requiring the Planning Authority to change the plan. So we revert um, back to Council today because we do not have scope within the recommendations from the 24th of February to agree the direction without further recourse to Council because one of the aspects of the direction changes one of our policies, as I'll describe. So as per paragraph four of the report, since the adoption of National Plan and Framework 4, Scottish ministers appear to have been regularly issuing directions in order that new local development plans comply with NPF 4. And before that, a direction was quite a rare occurrence. As only parts of the plan which legislatively fall under the scope of examination processes are those which receive representations, there will always be elements of a local development plan which avoid the examination process and ministers might therefore deem modifications are required. So just on uh, Monday this week, um, the Scottish ministers determined a direction was necessary in terms of LDP2 to take account of NPF4 and those changes are detailed in Appendix 1 of your paper. Most of those are really quite inconsequential. The most significant change is to policy res 6, which is on gypsy travellers. Um, and the purpose of the change, as I said, is to align it with national policy as set out in NPF 4. Um, we spoke to Scottish Government on Monday and they advised that during the preparation of NPF 4, there was significant work undertaken with the gypsy traveller community to ensure that the wording of NPF 4 was uh, non-discriminatory and that therefore the national policy embodies best practice. And having considered um, that and spoken to Scottish ministers, officers are content with the proposed wording and the rationale for that direction. So some implications set out in paragraphs 7 to 10 and the two recommendations at paragraph 2, which seek approval to accept that direction and modify the plan and thereafter um, move to adoption. Um, and we don't need to go back to Scottish ministers again to adopt the plan. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Provost. Aaron, thank you very much, folks. Uh, open it out for any discussion. Um, I understand the, the reason why this is, came today. Are there any questions or comments? We're okay. The recommendations are on uh, page whatever, and and it's accepts a, a direction set out with Scottish ministers and set out in Appendix One. Are we okay with the recommendation? Thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks for today. I hope everybody has a, a, a really safe weekend. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Happy Easter, Provost, when it comes. <laughs> <laughs>